Okay. <clears throat> so we can uh, carry on, as I say, yeah. and uh, where we left off this morning, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's actually, it's really cool. I was going to say about that mosquito net. That's pretty cool. That's like the the mother monks news in Thailand. You know that mosquito nets kind of held up. So if you want to feel like a monk in Thailand, just go and sit under that mosquito net, and you you know what it's like. Yeah. And then you can decide whether you want to ordain or not. Yeah. <laughs> Once you know the feeling of these things. So. Anyway, so this morning we had a like an introduction to uh, meditation, just kind of some of the very basics. And uh, I didn't say anything at the time about uh, mindfulness of breathing, uh, which is one of the main kind of meditation topics uh, in the suttas. Uh, so now I want to get into that, which is where this all starts. So. And uh, uh, just... Uh, Maybe to start out with a little bit of the uh, kind of transition uh, from uh, what I was saying this morning, how we tran make the transition from just kind of general awareness uh, to the watching the breath. And one of the uh, ideas that I think I mentioned early on is this idea of uh, waiting for the breath to arise. Yeah, the idea of you, you sit back, you wait for kind of enough mindfulness to be there, you wait for the clarity of the mind to come, and then as you wait, patiently things calm down, things become clear, you nudge the mind a little bit to kind of feel a bit of joy, in all of these kind of things, and there comes a point when the meditation goes well, that the breath sort of is just there, because the breath is always there, hopefully, otherwise you have a problem if the breath isn't there, so it's kind of there somewhere, and suddenly it just comes into focus uh, because you uh, the clarity of the mind arises. Uh, and that's kind of when you start doing mindfulness or breathing. Yeah? It's almost like automatic. Yeah? There's nothing really you have to do. The thing just kind of works on its own. Uh. I know there are some people who don't find the breath in that way. Uh, and for them it might, you may need a little bit more of a deliberate effort. Uh. So as always there are lots of individual differences. Uh, and so no size fits all, and no meditation technique is going to be right for everyone. Uh, so you need to basically in the end take responsibility for yourself and monitor your own uh, progress. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then you know try something else, something alternative, or ask a question about it or whatever. Uh, but uh, the general idea works for many people. You just kind of calm down, you allow things to be, become peaceful. Uh, just enjoy the peace, incline the mind to peace. Uh, Maybe incline it to some positive perceptions, uh, and then eventually the breath just tends to arise. Uh, and this is the right uh, and good approach uh, to thinking about the breath meditation. Uh, one thing you should never do uh, is to go to the breath straight away. You, know, you sit down and you kind of watch the breath straight away. Uh, and the reason is that nobody, barely anyone, is ready to watch the breath straight away. Because straight away your mind will be a little bit busy with something, there will be things going on. Uh, and the only way that you can watch the breath straight away is by using willpower. Uh, you know, you're going to really have to force your mind onto that breath. Uh, otherwise the mind basically rebels, it doesn't want to do it. Uh, and the idea here is to avoid the willpower, is to make it a natural process. Uh, I mentioned that um, this morning, the idea that meditation is a natural process, it does not come about through an act of will. Yeah, and uh, the point is that if something is natural uh, and you use will on a natural process, uh, you're going to disturb the natural process, right? Uh, if something happens naturally uh, and you're trying to use will on it, of course you're going to disturb it. Uh, and uh, Ajahn Brahm has this cute simile of a little child kind of getting, the mother is going to teach little child how to grow a plant. Uh, yeah, have you heard that simile? Yeah. <laughs> it's very cute. So the mother is going to okay, give the little, little child gives them a sunflower seed or something. Yeah, sunflowers become nice and tall and, and beautiful. So it uh, gives a sunflower seed to the child and says, okay, plant, put the seed in under the earth. Yeah, it's not too deep, it's kind of a, an inch or a couple of centimeters, whatever it is, under the, under the earth. Uh, and then every day you can water it a little bit. Don't water too much, but it will drown the seed. Just water just the right amount. Uh, and the child is very excited. Yeah, little children can be very excitable, you know, very cute when they're excited. Uh, and so you water the, water the seed, and after a few days, it starts to sprout out of the ground. And the child is very excited. Mommy, mommy, look, it's coming out of the ground. Uh, yeah? And then, but of course, it grows slowly. Yeah? The child gets very impatient. Uh, because it gets impatient after it's only a kind of a centimeter above the ground, uh, it decides to help nature a little bit. Uh. 
<laughs> let's help nature. So we kind of decide, okay, let's help it. If it pulls, it grows faster. It makes sense. It's kind of reasonable thought. So you pull that little sprout coming out and bang, the whole thing is destroyed. Uh, just like your meditation is destroyed if you use too much willpower here. Uh. So the idea of nature is that it has a natural evolution of its own. Uh, and if you try to force that evolution, if you try to force the growth, uh, try to force it to happen, actually you destroy it. Uh. So this is why willpower is not only unpleasant, uh, because it makes you tense, uh, it makes the mind tired, uh, etc. Actually, it is counterproductive. Uh. So the idea is then to kind of just uh, stand back. Uh. And, uh, but it's not as if it is a complete standing back, right? Uh, I mean, one of the things I was talking about before was the idea of giving rise to joy uh, and using your perceptions uh, in the right way. Uh, and of course, that is doing something here. Uh, yeah? It's not a complete passivity here. Uh, but that doing, I would call it more like nudging the mind rather than really using willpower. Uh, it's a very gentle use of your perception. Uh, you lean your perception towards the idea of good spiritual friends or towards the idea of uh, your generosity in the past. It's a very gentle thing. Yeah? You don't think too hard about it. You don't force your mind onto kind of uh, these ideas. If it doesn't come naturally, it doesn't really work. So it's a gentle thing. Okay, I did this in the past. Yeah? Uh, it's more like bringing up a memory. You don't even think about it very much, like a perception of generosity or something like that. Uh, and bang, the good feeling arises as a consequence. Uh, so this very, whole process should be very gentle and easy. Yeah? And then, when your mind then achieves the kind of mindfulness that we're talking about here, yeah, then that is when you are ready to watch the breath, or the breath watching happening happens by itself. Uh, it just occurs. Uh, and um, uh, how do you know that you are mindful enough? Uh, well, this is where you have to experiment a little bit. Uh, but the basic idea is that you have a sense of presence, uh, and the presence is fairly clear, right? Uh, it doesn't mean you are completely free of thinking that then you're never going to start washing the breath. It just means that it is a reasonable degree of presence and a reasonable degree of clarity with that presence. Then you are mindful there. Um, that's really where this starts. I want to talk a little bit about mindfulness, what the meaning of that, but maybe I should wait a little bit with that. Let's just do the introductory part of the sutta, first of all. So this... Uh, Particular sutta is the uh, well-known sutta on mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, yeah. Majjhima Nikaya 118. Yeah. And because this course is called Breath to Breath to Awakening, yeah, this is the sutta which describes exactly that Breath to Breath to Awakening. Yeah. It might as well have been the alternative title to the sutta because that is exactly the content of the sutta. So that's kind of exciting, right? Yeah. So I you, hope you're a bit excited by this, uh, because uh, awakening is kind of what this is all about. Uh. So uh, this is uh, an extract uh, from a very long sutta. This is like the main part of the sutta. It starts out by talking about how all the kind of most important monks at the time of the Buddha, they all come together, yeah, they're all, everyone is there. And the Buddha says, this monks practice like this, other monks practice like that. Uh, and he gives this large number of various ways of practicing. Uh, and then the one thing he singles out is mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. That's interesting, right? Uh, because what this means, well, first of all, the fact that there are so many of the most senior monastics are present, Venerable Sariputta, Mahamogalana, Mahakachana, uh, Venerable Ananda, b b Venerable Upal, they can't remember, there's heaps of them available, available there, present during the talk. Yeah. And uh, then when they're all present, it means that it's a powerful, it's a, it's a very important occasion, uh, yeah, when so many senior monastics come together. Uh, there's no nuns mentioned as, as usual, that's kind of the way the suttas tend to be, uh, but maybe they're there in the background as well. Uh. And then during that part point, uh, when there are so many important monastics present, uh, and then he mentions the various ways of doing meditation, he singles out breath meditation at that time. Uh, to me that is quite significant. Uh, yeah? It means that there is something special about, uh, maybe there is something special about breath meditation. Uh, and this kind of brings us to this general idea, how do we decide, are there suttas that are more important than other suttas? Uh, how do we decide what are the most important suttas? And uh, the way to decide is really 
twofold. Either the Buddha says this sutta is really important, uh, and sometimes he will say that, like in the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta on the Buddha's pa uh, passing away, uh, he talks about what the Dhamma is, uh, yeah, what are these teachings, and he defines it for us. Uh, and he says the Dhamma really is the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, the 37 aids to awakening. Yeah. This is the Dhamma. And when you look at those 37, it is like the Eightfold Path, the Seven Factors of Awakening, the Five Spiritual Faculties, the Four Satipatthanas, the Four uh, Right Efforts. Uh, so adding up, there's a couple of more, but adding up to 37 altogether. Yeah. So that's what he says there. So that is one way of deciding, because the Buddha points it out. This is what really matters. Uh, Another way of deciding on the importance of a sutta is how often are they spoken, right? There are certain suttas you find again and again, given to different audiences, given in different places. And of course, if the Buddha repeats something again and again in many places, we can assume that it must have been a core part of these teachings. Yeah, so this is really how you decide whether something is important or not. And from that uh, with that kind of view in the background, it is clear that Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, is a significant and important sutta. Maybe not terribly more important than other suttas, but certainly a core part of these teachings. So uh, th th this is actually a very important topic. Yeah. Because one of the surprising things that you find in the Buddhist world, I don't know if you, any of you kind of hang out in, on the internet and argue about Buddhist ideas on the internet, uh, <laughs> One of the things that you find out very quickly is that uh, a lot of Buddhist arguments are about obscure teachings, uh, yeah, really obscure stuff. Uh, and a lot of the time there is a tendency to interpret the majority of suttas uh, through obscure teachings. Uh, there are some very well-known obscure phrases in the suttas, I'm, I'm not going to mention them because for most of you probably won't make much sense anyway. Uh, uh, but uh, there are some very obscure things, and they kind of people build up these whole theories about the meaning of nibbana, the meaning of uh, profound things based on obscure passages. And this is the wrong way of going about it. Uh, and I remember Ajahn Brahm told me, Ajahn Brahm has traveled a lot around the world, he told me going to Sri Lanka, going to the forest hermitage in Sri Lanka. Uh, you know the forest hermitage? Uh, have you heard about the forest hermitage? No. <laughs> For example, is it in Kandy in Sri Lanka, right? For example, it is the Uddhavata Kela Reserve. Yeah, okay, so this, this is the uh, beautiful forest uh, uh, close to the lake, not so far from the Temple of the Tooth. Uh, and uh, it's kind of where the, uh, the forest hermitage was built in connection with the Buddhist Publication Society. And the first person to stay there, I think, was the Anaponika Terra. Yeah, he was a German a kind of scholarly monk, and he stayed there, and that's where he did lots of translations into German. And he was still alive when Ajahn Brahm was in Sri Lanka back in 1992, the first time or something like that, and Ajahn Brahm was touring around Sri Lanka. Maybe that sounds a bit kind of frivolous. He was uh, visiting important places in Sri Lanka from a Dhamma perspective, and um, he went there, and one of the discussions they had was precisely about how to interpret the suttas. Yeah? So these are some of the greatest monks, some of the greatest scholars alive have studied the suttas in great depth. Not just the suttas, but a broad kind of category of Pali literature. And he said precisely this, that when you interpret the suttas, you should interpret them in line with the majority descriptions in the suttas. Those things that are core, they should form the backbone for how you understand the Dhamma. And usually when someone comes out with a favorite theory based on something obscure, you, can, you don't have to dismiss it straight away, but you should be skeptical straight away, because it actually is, uh, tends to be very dangerous and very dodgy. <laughs> so uh, this is a very useful port, uh, point of advice, uh, especially for those of you who are not super duper uh, skilled in reading the suttas. Uh, yeah, it can be very useful to have some such uh, basic ideas to found your sutta studies on her. And I could be wrong, of course, about all I've just said, so don't trust me. Yeah. But, uh, check it out for yourself and see if it makes sense. So, so let's have a look at this uh, sutta then. Uh. And um, this particular translation is by a monk called uh, uh, Venerable Sujato. Has anyone heard of Venerable Sujato? Huh? Yeah, so many, some of you have? Okay, yeah. He's an Australian monk, yeah. and he's got a kind of a big brain and a big head. Yeah. And so, and he, 
and, and he uses that to, to, to translate the suttas, which is good. He has, use your intelligence for something kind of, uh, something useful. That's kind of, instead of kind of doing silly things in the world that most, most people do. Uh, it's kind of, this is good, uh, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so you, straight away you know what is his translation because he, he translates monks. No, it's not monks, he translates bhikkhus uh, as mendicants. Uh, yeah, so this is how it starts off here. So let's just, uh, I'll just read a little bit and then I will comment on this. Uh. So this is what the Buddha says. Yeah, now all the senior monks are in front of him and it says mendicants. Uh, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it is very fruitful and beneficial. Mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh. The four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors. Uh, and the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, fulfill knowledge and freedom. Uh. So, just uh, starting at the beginning there, this idea of a mendicant. Uh, yeah, this is like a slightly old-fashioned English word. Uh, is that right? Slightly old-fashioned? Uh, yeah, you don't, most people don't hear people on the street saying mendicants, 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 no. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it actually is a very precise translation of the idea of bhikkhu, because bhikkhu literally means that someone who receives alms, yeah? You kind of go into the village, you receive alms and these kind of things. Uh, and bhikkhu is based on that idea. And bhikkhuni, yeah, is also based on, as a feminine version of that word, uh, also based on the idea as an alms gatherer, yeah? And the word, English word for that precisely is mendicant. Uh, so, it's a kind of nice word in that sense. And also it is gender neutral. Uh, and one of the things that you find in the suttas is that very often they are addressed to the monks. Uh, and you may think that because they are addressed to the monks, that the bhikkhunis, they didn't get any teachings, yeah? The monks got all the teachings, uh, the bhikkhunis had to figure it all out for, on the, for, the, for themselves. Uh, but no, that would be the wrong conclusion. Uh, and the reason why that is the wrong conclusion is because the way the things are spoken in uh, these ancient Indian languages, the addressing always happens to the most senior people present. Uh, and because the bhikkhus would be the most senior, because the bhikkhu sangha was established first, they have been around for a longer time, uh, and the bhikkhunis probably maybe sit a little bit to one side, uh, and that sort of thing. So it is always spoken to the bhikkhus. Uh, it does not mean that the assembly only consists of bhikkhus. Uh, very often there will have been bhikkhunis in that assembly. Uh, very often there will have been lay people in that assembly. Yeah? So even if you're a lay person, you don't have to feel left out. Uh, yeah? so, um, Many people would have been there. In fact, it was common in those days uh, for everyone to come to the monastery on the Uposada days. Uh, yeah, the Uposada, the full moon, the new moon, and the half moon days. Uh, that's when you would come to the monastery and you would listen to discourses. Uh. So mendicancy is really a shorthand for Buddhists. Yeah, something like that. All Buddhists are welcome, regardless of who you are. Uh, and non-Buddhists as well. Yeah, if you are not a Buddhist, that's okay. Uh, I don't know if everyone here considers themselves a Buddhist, maybe you don't, and that's okay, as long as you're not anti-Buddhist. <laughs> that would be a bit unfortunate, so... <laughs> At least you're leaning in the Buddhist direction. So, mendicants, it's a nice word. A downside with the use of the word like mendicant is that if you have English as your second language, then you kind of feel a bit stumped when you come across these words, because it's not really used very much in modern literature. So probably you'll be confused. And one of the ideas behind the, uh, these translations specifically is to make it available to anyone, yeah? whether you have English as your second language or first language or whatever, uh, to make it, because a lot more people read the suttas uh, who have English as their second language uh, than have English as their first language. Uh. So that is uh, kind of good to know. Uh. So you have to have your reader in mind as well when you make these translations. Anyway, let's get on with the Dhamma. Mendicant, so when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, yeah, so it has to be developed and cultivated, it takes time to kind of make this practice work, you have to do it again and again and again, and gradually the results start to emerge. Yeah? It is very fruitful and beneficial now. Yeah, and we shall see in a second that it takes you all the way to awakening. Yeah? I, I, I find that so... Uh, 
marvelous in a sense. Yeah, we're dealing with one of the most kind of humble things in life, the most ordinary things in existence, the breath. Uh, it is so ordinary, we pay it ha hardly any attention at all. Uh. When are you aware that you breathe? Uh? Well, if you're a Buddhist, maybe you, <laughs> sometimes you are, but uh, the majority of people have no idea that they're breathing. Yeah? The, breath, the body just does its thing. Yeah? It is so extraordinarily ordinary. Yeah? And yet, uh, if we use it in the right way, simply by putting attention on it, uh, it takes you all the way to the highest happiness that is possible to achieve. Uh. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? Uh? This very simple thing. Uh, you don't need to imagine any strange realms. Uh, you don't need to kind of... Uh, and get into this very kind of imaginary, Im imaginative or fantasy uh, inducing uh, mental proliferations. Uh, you don't need to do uh, meditation, like the casino meditation, visualizing all kinds of things. Uh, it's something very, very down to earth, uh, very settling, very, that actually stabilizes the mind, doesn't confuse the mind, uh, but gives the mind a kind of natural stability and, and um, peace, hopefully, down the track. Yeah. And to me, that is so reassuring. Yeah. To me, the idea of real spiritual practice, it should be down to earth, it should produce clarity, it should produce groundedness, it shouldn't produce flights of fancy and all of these kind of things. Yeah. So this idea that the breath is all we need to do all the way to awakening, yeah, to me is a very uh, compelling idea. Yeah. It's not just breath meditation, of course, you need something to support the breath meditation, and that is just sila, morality, kindness. Yeah which also is very kind of down-to-earth, yeah, there's nothing kind of very fancy about that. Uh, and this, then, is what we need to do. Uh. And as the Buddha says, it is very fruitful uh, and beneficial. Uh. And this is often how the Buddha will phrase things in the suttas. He will say, ah, this is, this is really happy, this is very beneficial, very fruitful. Uh. And remember, the Buddha, he was understated. Uh. Yeah, and you know a bit about that here in the UK, understatement, so you know what the Buddha was like. Yeah. When the Buddha says something is happy, he means the highest happiness. Yeah. When the Buddha says something is very fruitful, he doesn't mean like just very fruitful, he means like absolutely the highest possible fruit and benefit you can have. Yeah. Yeah, so when you read the suttas, there's another very useful kind of tool of interpretation. Yeah. Because uh, when someone says, oh, I'm happy, if you are American and you're British, yeah, you mean exactly the opposite thing, right? Uh, the British say he's happy means, wow, it, it, it is really, really happy. The British never say they're happy. They're kind of fair to middling or something, but they're not happy, right? It's very rare. <laughs> Unless something has changed in Britain since I lived here. But uh, <laughs> an American says happy it means nothing. It just means it's not ordinary. It's not like, okay, whatever. Yeah, oh yeah, today I'm ecstatic. Yeah, things are going really well. It's Americans kind of, they're the opposite of the overstated. The British are understated. Uh, so the Buddha was more like the British. Yeah. <laughs> I was want to make that point because actually it matters when you interpret the suttas, right? Because you have a feeling for how the Buddha is speaking actually matters uh, interpreting things in the right way. Yeah. So um, anyway, I don't actually I forgot to ask if there are many Americans uh, here. <laughs> Always scary. <laughs> Anyway, so okay, good. I'm probably going to offend a lot of people doing this. I'm just be aware of that. So this, this, this is the problem when you talk so much, right? You offend lots of people. Right? Oh well, <laughs> we'll see. See how many people I cannot offend on this retreat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then that's the first sentence. So then the Buddha says, mindfulness of breathing when developed and cultivated, fulfills the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Four kinds of mindfulness meditation, this is satipatthana, yeah? uh, often considered like the core of Buddhist meditation practice, and not necessarily for particularly good reasons. Yeah, it's just that people take out the satipatthana sutta and they say, this, you know, learn this, bow down to this, pray to this, sometimes it's literally praying to the sutta, and uh, that is not really such a good idea. Satipatthana sutta is one sutta among suttas, uh, and it doesn't really have any pride of place. Uh, the Buddha never says this is the most important, uh, this has just been decided by people later on. Uh, so uh, when we talk about mindfulness meditation, eh, we're talking about satipatthana, yeah? So how do you do satipatthana practice? According to this, all you have to do is mindfulness of breathing. It fulfills the Satipatthana practice. 
And this is a very useful information to my mind. Uh, and the reason why it is so useful is because if you go travel around to various meditation centers, various meditation techniques around the world, uh, you find that there are everyone has their own interpretation of Satipatthana. Uh, Gwenka has his interpretation, Mahasi Sayado has his, his uh, interpretation, um, Rubakin or whatever has his interpretation, yeah, and everyone has their own interpretation of this. Uh, and so you wonder, is there any neutral interpretation which doesn't rely on modern kind of meditation masters? Uh, I'm not saying that these are, are all wrong, that's not really my point. My point is just that you get all of this information without really grounding necessarily in the suttas. Uh, and so to me, this to me is the most interesting thing because the Buddha says if you want to fulfill Satipatthana, all you have to do is watch the breath. Uh, you kind of cut through all that complexity uh, that often arises with Satipatthana practice. Yeah? Watch the feelings in the body, watch your mind. Uh, this, is, this should be seen like this, this should be seen like that. Uh, and one of the common errors uh, in all, all of these meditation systems uh, is the idea that mindfulness of breathing only pertains to the very beginning of meditation. Uh, yeah? You start out the meditation practice uh, and in the Satipatthana in the in the Satipatthana Sutta, there are four parts to it. Yeah? those of you who know the suttas will know these four parts. The first one is contemplation of the body, kaya nupasana, contemplation of feelings, vedana nupasana, contemplation of mind, chitta nupasana, contemplation of phenomena, principles, whatever, dhamma nupasana. These are the four. So four areas, and the first of those areas. When you read about that in the Satipatthana Sutta, uh, that is the only place uh, where it mentions mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Uh, those of you who are uh, the true scholars uh, <laughs> of, of suttas, uh, it's the only place where you find mindfulness of breathing. And because of that, uh, there is this general sense uh, yeah, that mindfulness of breathing is the most basic form of Satipatthana. It only belongs to the very first of the four Satipatthanas. Uh, when you go to mind mindfulness of feelings, uh, the citta nupassana or contemplation of feelings, the breath is not mentioned. Uh, so what that must mean, some conclude. Uh, yeah? Some means those will... No, I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> It's a good thing I stop myself sometimes. Mindfulness arises just in time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, so it's not mentioned there. And so then the argument is, okay, you watch the breath first of all. When you come to feelings, you just watch the feelings in the body or something like that. When you come to the mind, you watch mental phenomena. But uh, that would be a wrong understanding because in the Anapanasati Sutta, it says mindfulness of breathing fulfills everything, all of these four areas. And so you may wonder then, well, why is it that in the Satipatthana Sutta it talks about mindfulness of breathing only in the beginning, whereas here it says it fulfills everything? How come there is this discrepancy? What is, what is actually going on here? And to be able to understand how such things arise, you have to kind of go into much deeper study of the suttas, uh, where you do comparative study uh, and you look at suttas, the same sutta having come down in different languages. Uh, and for example, all of these suttas exist, not all of them, but certainly this one and also the Satipatthana Sutta, they exist, for example, in ancient Chinese. Uh, you can read it in ancient Chinese characters. Uh, and you have to know your Chinese really well. Even most modern readers of Chinese find it hard to read because uh, all languages develop, obviously. Uh, and it also exists in Sanskrit versions, uh, it exists in very different schools, uh, uh, Abhidhamma version, etc., etc. And when you look at that, uh, you start to realize that the mindfulness of breathing probably never belonged inside the Satipatthana Sutta. That seems to have maybe come at some later point. Uh, so the right, the more, more appropriate, probably, interpretation of Satipatthana is that the mindfulness of breathing actually covers the whole thing. Yeah? And it doesn't really belong inside the first Satipatthana as the way you find it in the Satipatthana Sutta. If you don't understand, if you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, uh, never mind. Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I realize that this probably gets a bit complicated, but some of you will understand because you have enough understanding of the Sutta. So. But the main point here is simply that all you have to do uh, to fulfill all meditation 
all that every meditation ever done, huh? or ever, if ever needed to reach awakening, huh? is mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? yeah, very straightforward, very simple. Huh? One of the interesting things uh, is that uh, the Buddha himself uh, used mindfulness of breathing to reach awakening. Yeah? Yeah, there is a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya 54, Anapanasati Sangyutta, the connected discourses on uh, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? Number eight, I think it is. Uh, is. And the Buddha says that he used mindfulness of breathing often, frequently, yeah? and he reached awakening based on that. Yeah? And uh, so uh, that is kind of nice, right? Uh, you can, now you can start to see why he kind of uh, uh, lifts it up so much and kind of emphasizes the mindfulness of breathing here. So uh, that is uh, how mindfulness of breathing uh, fulfills uh, Satipatthana. Um, it's interesting what... Uh, Satipatthana, what it actually uh, means, uh, yeah, w w one of the things, what it's actually referred to. Uh, um, and well, maybe this is a good point, just to very briefly just discuss the idea of sati in the sutta. Sati is the word for mindfulness, right? Uh, used by the Buddha everywhere. Uh, and uh, what does it actually mean to be mindful? I mentioned before that the idea of mindfulness is the idea of awareness, uh, yeah, you are present. Uh, yeah, and uh, this, and you have a certain clarity of mind. Uh, basically, the defilements are quite low in the mind. This is kind of how you have enough clarity. Uh, it's very interesting connection. You know how the this is called the gradual training, right? So the, in the gradual training, the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Factor number six is called right effort. Uh, factor number seven is called mindfulness meditation, satipatthana. And they follow each other. One leads to the next one. So right effort is what leads to right meditation or mindfulness meditation. And some of the phrasings in here are actually they, you can see how the, the wording used to describe these various elements, how they evolve within the descriptions of what these things are. So in the uh, right effort formula, it says that you uh, use the right effort so that unskillful qualities do not invade your mind. Yeah, so this is what right, right effort is about. It's to stop unskillful qualities, uh, greed, right, uh, ill will, these sort of things. You stop those from invading your mind. So invading means quite strong. A little bit left is okay. It's not actually okay, but it's... Uh, it's, uh, what's the right word? It's to be expected, yeah? You, you purify that later on. But at this point, you want to get rid of the worst part of it. Uh. And then when you come to Satipatthana, it says, having overcome uh, those unskillful, unskillful qualities. Uh. So you can see the natural progression, how one thing leads to the next one, uh, right? Uh, that's kind of interesting there. And so Satipatthana is a place uh, where you have overcome uh, many of these unskillful qualities. Uh. And that makes sense, right? I mean, how can you have sati, mindfulness, if you have a lot of desire or ill will? Desire and ill will are precisely the things that take you away from the present moment. Desire is always in the future. Ill will is often in the past, yeah? Because it has to do with people did this, people did that, and this kind of stuff. And so, overcoming these things, it makes very good sense that that actually is required before mindfulness is possible. And that's why right effort, a very important aspect of right effort, is the overcoming of the defilement, the coarse aspects of the defilements of the mind. Uh, yeah, things we call sense restraint, which basically means being wise about how you think, yeah, where it kind of comes down to. Uh. So this is one side of the idea of sati. Yeah? Sati is uh, awareness to this extent. Uh, but sati is also memory. It also means memory in the suttas. Uh. Yeah, and memory, it is defined specifically as someone who has a lot of sati. This is the sat indriya, the faculty of sati in the sutta, so the power of, of mindfulness, uh, is defined specifically as remembering what you did and said long ago. Uh. So if your mind is clear, uh, if you have few defilements, uh, you will tend to remember clearly what you said and what you did long ago. Uh. And this is an important part of the meditation practice. Uh. Yeah, because in the meditation practice, you want to monitor yourself all the time. Uh, you want to know whether you're doing the right thing, whether you're heading in the right direction. Uh, and the only way you can monitor yourself uh, is if you 
uh, is if you have a standard by which to monitor things. And that standard is the memory of the teachings of the Buddha, right? It doesn't mean you think about it all the time, it, but it's kind of there at the back of your mind, guiding you in the right direction. Yeah? You have clarity about what you're supposed to be doing here. Yeah? You have a memory. Without really thinking about it, it is there as a kind of background instruction in your mind. Yeah? And this is how the meditation then comes together. The clarity, together with the instructions, uh, being kind of lodged in your mind in this way. Yeah? That is what sati is about. Uh. So meditation is not just something that is... Uh, automatic, you just sit down. It's also about having that clarity whether you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Okay, I'm probably getting a little bit sidetracked, but anyway, that's... Uh, uh, okay, just... Uh, okay, so then that is how you fulfill the four mindfulness meditation, simply by cultivating the breath meditation. Uh. How do uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, when developed and cultivated, fulfill the seven awakening factors? Uh, and the seven awakening factors are known as the Satta Sambhojanga in Pali language. Uh, and these are the things that uh, lead to awakening. That's why they're called awakening factors. Uh, they're not factors of awakening, they are factors that lead to awakening. Uh, and this is explicitly said in the suttas. Uh, so, what that means is that when you watch the breath in this way, you are actually developing the awakening factors. Right? They are arising in your mind as the breath gets developed, as the breath meditation develops. Yeah? What are they? Well, they are things like pity. Pity is like joy, right? Uh, tranquility, pasadi in Pali, the kind of really kind of when you feel really, really still uh, within and just want to sit here forever. Uh, yeah, you never want to leave this night and center ever again because you're so relaxed and so at ease. Uh, yeah? This is where we're trying to get you by the end of this retreat. Uh. Uh, and then there is uh, samadhi, uh, right? which is the stillness of the mind. Uh, and there's also some early factors like mindfulness and energy. Energy is part of that. Uh. All of these marvelous things and all of these uh, arise out of mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and we'll see that shortly. Uh, or maybe tomorrow, whenever, whenever, how these factors come out of just watching the breath. So it's kind of amazing what can be found in the breath. Yeah, this kind of boring thing actually turns out, I mean, not very boring at all, but actually extremely exciting and interesting. And then it says, the seven awakening factors, when developed and cultivated, they fulfill knowledge and freedom. And knowledge and freedom are the very end of the Buddhist path. Uh, knowledge here is basically uh, the knowledge that you are awakened. Yeah, it often also means things like knowledge of past lives and karma and these kind of things. But uh, the main thing it means is the knowledge of awakening. Yeah, you know that you're an arahant. Uh, if you have doubts about whether you're an arahant, you're not an arahant. Uh, so just to be clear, yeah, in case anyone thinks you're an arahant, so just do that. Yeah. <laughs> So you know that, because you know that birth has ended. Yeah? You know the connection, the causal connection between <coughs> craving and rebirth and all these kind of things. And so you know that you have, you've reached the pinnacle of the, uh, the purpose of the, of the uh, spiritual life. Uh, and you have attained freedom. Yeah? Freedom. You are freedom from what exactly? Well, freedom from dukkha, from suffering. Yeah? Freedom from the defilements of the mind, these defilements that boss you around all the time. Yeah? And uh, so this idea of freedom is a very, you know, a very kind of evocative and beautiful idea. Because it means that until this point you have basically been in prison without knowing it. You are, you are one of these imprisoners, imprisoned people who have no idea that you are in prison. You are imprisoned in like a lower realm. Your mind is trapped in this lower reality here, without really understanding that that is the case. Your mind is trapped by the sense of self that bosses you around, make you do all kinds of useless things in the world, never really finding the happiness that it wants to find. Kind of weird, you have a sense of self that wants to be happy, but the sense of self actually stands in the way of that happiness. Kind of strange, isn't it? And so you liberate yourself from this prison of the world, and as you emerge from that prison, you attain the freedom of awakening here. So these are kind of really powerful and beautiful ideas, the idea of being liberated in this way here. So, um, 
one of the kind of interesting debates that people sometimes have is the idea of a freedom of will. Do we have freedom of will in the world? Right? And uh, the Buddhist idea of freedom of the will, uh, it doesn't really matter so much in Buddhism. Okay, we have freedom of the will, you can go for lunch, you can choose the potatoes or the carrots, and you can choose two or three or whatever. You, that's kind of the, this is kind of the ordinary idea of freedom of the will. Are you forced to choose two carrots, or can you actually choose three? That's, that's, kind, of the, that's kind of how far it goes, freedom of the will, right? Uh, it's not that exciting. In Buddhism, the idea of freedom is the idea that you block those things, those barriers, uh, that enable you to choose something which is truly meaningful. So in Buddhism, those barriers are the hindrances. Those barriers are the defilements. Once you take away those barriers, you can choose that things that are truly happy. You can choose samadhi, you can choose the jhanas, you can choose awakening. As long as those barriers are there, you cannot even choose these things. So what kind of freedom of will is that? So that is the Buddhist idea of freedom of the will, is to take away the barriers uh, that actually then enable you afterwards to choose things that really are meaningful. Uh, that to me is a much more interesting uh, way of thinking about this whole idea of freedom of the will. Uh, and that is the freedom you are achieving here, real freedom of the will. Now you can choose what actually brings happiness. Before you were trapped in some kind of lower, lower reality, you couldn't even choose these things. Uh, yeah. Now that possibility is there, and of course you will choose it, because you have the ability here. So that is uh, kind of the uh, introduction paragraph uh, to what we're going to look at next, and sometimes these introduction paragraphs are very interesting, maybe sometimes the most interesting part of uh, these suttas. Uh, but um, let's go to the next paragraph here, which is also kind of introductory actually. Uh, and how is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated to be very fruitful and beneficial? It is when a mendicant uh, gone to a wilderness, uh, I don't know, peak district, does that count as wilderness? Maybe, yeah, close enough. Uh, yeah. uh, to the root of a tree or the foot of a tree, uh, or to an empty hut, sits down cross-legged, uh, sets the body straight, uh, and establishes mindfulness in front of them. Uh, just mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. So this is the, uh, the kind of the real introductory paragraph. Uh, and this tells you what you have to do before you start mindfulness of breathing. And uh, yeah, this is about a mendicant, but of course it really applies to everyone. Uh, uh, you have this phrase at the beginning, gone to the wilderness, uh, the foot of a tree or the root of a tree, or an empty hut. Uh, yeah? And the idea here is that this is all about seclusion. Uh, yeah? Once you start reading the suttas and you read it with kind of uh, sufficient awareness, uh, you will see that the idea of seclusion is found everywhere in the suttas. Uh, it is incredibly prominent. Uh, and I remember it took me a while to actually see that, uh, because you're not really used to, you know, your, our attention is pre-kind of uh, conditioned. Uh, yeah? So you see certain things depending on what your teacher emphasizes, what other people have told you, what you have read about. Uh, and sometimes the reconditioning of yourself to actually see things that you're not preconditioned to see, actually it's a very difficult. Uh, and sometimes you have to read things again and again and again, and when you've read it for the hundredth time, it don't say, wait a minute, uh, there's something going on here. Uh, it takes a long time to see things sometimes like this. Uh, and I remember it dawned on me one day, actually these words for seclusion are found everywhere. Uh, and sometimes you need to know the Pali because you need to know the different kinds of words for seclusion, how they relate to each other and these kind of things. Uh, and then it kind of becomes very obvious. Uh, and so what this means is that real mindfulness of breathing uh, happens in seclusion. Uh, in other words, it's a very profound kind of meditation practice. It is not superficial. So if you find it difficult to do mindfulness of breathing in daily life, yeah, when you go to work and all these kind of things, no wonder you find it harder. Of course you find it harder. It's kind of, you know, this, is, this is something that happens really after you develop the path a long way and you go into seclusion. This is pretty good. What we have here is a kind of a halfway house to real seclusion. Yeah? You kind of get out of your ordinary environment. It is quite peaceful. You are very peaceful as well, that's great. It's nice. And it is, you have your own, many of you will have your own room, probably. 
And uh, so that's kind of nice, yeah? You can go for a walk in the woods uh, over here. And there is, this is not bad. It's not maybe the full seclusion, but it's kind of getting there. Uh, if you want more full seclusion, uh, go and stay in a monastery for a while. Uh, yeah, get yourself a little cutie or a little room or something in a monastery. Uh, if you want to come all the way to Australia, come, come all the way to Australia. We have nice cuties ready for you. Uh, now you have kind of the inside uh, uh, kind of uh, track, yeah, because you have... Uh, you can say that, well, you know, I, I went to one of these retreats and now I kind of uh, have a, a right to a cutie and put it down a monastery or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, seclusion, very important. Uh, yeah, you withdraw the mind, you withdraw yourself from the ordinary worldly things. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, a city life or life in the suburbia or whatever, it is often very busy. And not only is it busy, but it is surrounded with sensual input. Uh, yeah, in your home you have maybe television, you have computers, you have all this entertainment, you have a nice kitchen where you make delightful food, you have all these kind of sensual stimulation is everywhere in the city life and also at home. But if you come to a meditation center like this, it is much reduced. So it allows the mind to kind of withdraw a little bit, ideally anyway, withdraw a little bit from all that sensory input. And then when you withdraw physically, then the mind also withdraws. One thing leading to another, kaya viveka leading to chitta viveka, seclusion of the body leading to seclusion of the mind. So if you feel that your meditation is going well, and I can guarantee that there are people here whose meditation is going well, on a retreat like this, there's all kinds of people, some people who are having difficulties, so, and that's fine to have difficulties, nothing wrong with that, it's just the nature of the mind. Other people who have, are kind of intermediate, and some people who are doing really, really well. And if you feel that you're going really, really well, it is sometimes worthwhile to take one step further. Uh, try to stay in a monastery for a while, or go on a more secluded retreat, or whatever it might be. Uh, yeah? Because that is where these things can really be developed, but only if you are ready. Uh, only if your mind has reached the stage where it is able to make good use of those uh, uh, peaceful situation around you. Uh. So it is a secluded practice, it is profound, it is deep, yeah? And this is how it can take you all the way to awakening. Yeah? And so you go to these places, the wilderness, the foot of a tree, the Buddha is often depicted as sitting at the foot of a tree, yeah? an empty hut, yeah? That's maybe the best one, an empty hut. Sunyagara is the Pali word for that. Uh, he sits down cross-legged, yeah? So, Breath meditation happens in the sitting posture. Uh, why? Well, because it is a very peaceful meditation. Uh, and if you become peaceful while walking, it can have very bad detrimental consequences uh, because suddenly you don't know what you're doing anymore. Uh, and you walk into the streets or you walk into a cow or something like that. Uh, and then you, <laughs> you know, there's a few cows around there uh, and you might have a problem. Uh, the cow may not understand that you're meditating, you see. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, you, uh, you sit down and so this is very suitable right here for sitting down, cross-legged. I don't think you have to sit cross-legged. What is most important is that you are comfortable. I think the reason why it says cross-legged is because that was the standard posture in those days. And it is quite nice once you get used to it. Uh, but uh, it, it is not, I don't think it is really required just because it was done in those days. What matters is that you are at ease, you feel like you let go of the body. That is the right kind of posture for you. And uh, people have all kinds of postures. Yeah, sitting on chairs is fine, sitting on little stools is fine. Some of you have nice little stools. Uh, uh, leaning against the wall is okay. Yeah, walking meditation is great. Some people, as I mentioned before, use lying down meditation. That is also fine, yeah, at least occasionally. And so just uh, experiment a little bit with what posture works for you. Again, what matters is that the body is at ease. That is the important, that is the right posture for you. I remember there was one monk many years ago who he kind of went into meditation while he was doing a yoga posture, standing on his head. And he said it was a bad idea. <laughs> Because he kind of woke up, collapsed on the floor, right, with kind of legs and arms kind of intertwined, yeah, and he didn't know what had happened there. But he kind of became very peaceful while he was in this yoga posture and kind of went into some lost control of his body and kind of bang, and kind of everything went wrong, yeah. So that is the one posture I do not recommend, yeah, so don't stand on your head and meditate. Yeah? Otherwise, almost anything goes. Ah, I may, uh, not sure, but ask me first if you have something really fancy 
going on. <laughs> so you sit down cross-legged, you set your body straight, right? Uh, Ujjukaya Panidaya. Uh, so the idea here, of course, is that when your body is quite straight, it kind of tends to clear the mind a little bit. But even here, set it straight at the right time. Yeah? In the beginning, if you feel very tired or very restless or whatever, and you force yourself to sit straight, it may actually be uncomfortable. Uh, so in the beginning, lean back against the wall. Uh, Ajahn Brahm tells me when he starts meditation, he leans against the wall, uh, right? Uh, just to wait for the mind to become clear. Then when the mind clears up, uh, you sit straight. Uh, Ajahn Brahm is one of the best meditators in, uh, I was going to say Perth, but maybe in Australia, maybe in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, it's one of the best, in the, maybe in the, I'm not sure if the non-universe is going too far, but uh, he's, he's pretty good, uh, he's pretty, pretty cool. So, so he, if he does that, yeah, then almost anyone else can do it. Uh, so remember to feel what works, yeah? what makes you relaxed, uh, what, how do you progress in the right way with it, and that is what is important. Uh, so start off leaning back, uh, yeah? then when your mind becomes clear, now on retreat you may not need to lean back so much, but again, see how it works. Then you kind of straighten up. You want to be straight when the mind is clear, it just feels right. Yeah? And then uh, you are in that posture the Buddha is talking about. Uh, then establishes mindfulness in front of them, right? And this is what I was saying all along. This is this idea that uh, before you watch the breath, you establish mindfulness first. We just had a discussion about this in one of the talks I was giving down in London just before. And someone was asking, I was saying that one of the translations of Satipatthana that you will find very often used, which is the wrong translation, is the foundations of mindfulness. It is wrong. I will explain to you why in a second. A right translation of Satipatthana might be application of mindfulness, right? That is my favorite translation. It is also these days you find the establishments of mindfulness, which is kind of okay. I don't not fully agree, but that's reasonably okay. Yeah. But I think application of mindfulness or focus of mindfulness, these are really good translations. So. And, um, and why? Why is that? Uh, yeah? what, what is going on here? And what is going on is that uh, this is just what we're seeing here. You're having established mindfulness first. Uh, the idea, if you say that something is the foundation of mindfulness, uh, it means that this is what you do to get mindfulness. Uh, right? If a practice is the foundation of mindfulness, uh, it means that if you do this practice, you will become mindful. Uh, that is the idea of that translation. But that is not what these things are about. Uh, they are not about using the breath to become mindful. They are about being mindful first, then coming to the breath. Uh, not breath, then mindfulness, but mindfulness first, then the breath. And this is what translations such as foundation of mindfulness make very hard to understand, because it seems to mean the opposite of what it actually means. That's why application of mindfulness is better, because that means you are using mindfulness to watch the breath. Mindfulness first, then watching the breath. This is exactly what we're seeing here, right? Establish mindfulness, then watch the breath. If you go to the Satipatthana Sutta, it actually says the same thing. It says that you do Satipatthana, you do it Satima. Satima means mindful, being mindful. Atapi Satima Sampajano Vineya Loka Vijanomanasang. This is kind of the introductory paragraph in the Satipatthana Sutta. Satima is one of those qualities. These are all qualities you have to establish to do Satipatthana practice. So, uh, yeah. So this is kind of really interesting, and this is the reason why I've been saying all along, don't go to the breath too soon. First establish mindfulness. First get that clarity of mind. First have a feeling that you really are reasonably well in the present. Then allow the breath to come. Then you are doing breath meditation. This is the reason for that. So I'm trying to base myself on the suttas all the way through, not just saying random stuff. So this is uh, non-random stuff, uh, <laughs> hopefully, yeah? It kind of comes from the, the Buddha, and this is basically what you find in all of these uh, suttas on Anapanasati. Yeah? So establish mindfulness first. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do here. Uh, 
And some of you may find that mindfulness does not become all that strong during the retreat for various kind of reasons, and that's fine. Please don't feel bad about it if you cannot do this. It just depends on how we have been born, our conditioning, and all of these kind of things. It's much better to be honest with yourself, to actually know where you're at, and then take it from there. And even if you spend the whole retreat just kind of doing, uh, you know, being peaceful and being quiet without actually going to the breath, it will still probably be really worthwhile. It has to be very interesting. You learn something about yourself. You learn something about what you have to do to enable the meditation for the future. So use all of these ideas I've talked about before of establishing mindfulness, just resting, nudging the mind a little bit, etc., etc., and then mindfulness hopefully will arise. If it doesn't arise super strongly, then the other way that mindfulness arises is that it arises through your long-term practice of the Dhamma. Everything you do in daily life would either be supportive of mindfulness or it would be detractive of mindfulness. So what is it that is supportive of mindfulness? And this is another very important point. There's so many very important points here. I say this, this is a very important point every two sentences, a bit, a bit over too much. <laughs> it's going to lose its power after a while. But anyway, it is, I think it is an important point. And this is the general assumption among meditators that mindfulness begets mindfulness. Mindfulness gives rise to mindfulness. So that if you are mindful in daily life of your various activities, just by the mere fact of being mindful in daily life, you will be more mindful when you meditate. Mindfulness begets mindfulness. Actually, there is no evidence of that in the suttas. This is very much kind of the modern technique. You are told, be mindful for everything you do. When you eat, eat mindfully. But you're not told why you should be mindful while you're eating. How you should do it. You're told to be mindful, as if mindfulness in itself is sufficient. But that is not really how the suttas work. As I mentioned before, there are two factors that make mindfulness possible according to the suttas. And those two are sila and ujjukaditi, the view and the virtue that you have. This is what gives rise to mindfulness according to the suttas. So the answer to this question about whether you should be mindful in daily life, yes, you should be mindful, but you should be mindful with the view to be live well, yeah, to live with kindness, to live virtuously, to be moral. That is why you should be mindful. So you should be mindful in a particular way, not just be mindful for the sake of mindfulness. And that is kind of, that changes the idea quite a lot, right? So if you are mindful while you're washing the dishes, well, what you are really mindful of is your mind should not be, oh, wash the dishes, oh, I'm fed up with washing the dishes, yeah? No, okay, I'm washing the dishes. What a wonderful opportunity to do some service, yeah? So I'm washing the dishes happily instead of, or whatever it is, you're mindful, knowing where your mind is at, knowing what you're saying, what you're doing. So you purify yourself continuously. That is the idea of mindfulness in daily life. All of this comes from this very famous formula in the Sutra called Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness and clear comprehension formula. And that is where this idea of mindfulness in daily life is derived from. And if you look carefully at how this is presented in the suttas, it actually is part of the sila part, part of the right effort, part of how to overcome the defilements of the mind. That is where it belongs. So please think about it in this way, and then the idea of mindfulness in daily life becomes far more meaningful to you. You really are purifying yourself in a very real way, and then it's going to become a powerful effect for you once you... Uh, come to a retreat, because then the mind will really be ready to be mindful now. 3.45? 4.45? Okay, sorry, 4.45 then. So I'm going to stop there now. Um, and uh, uh, this, so that's it for now. We're going to come back again at, what time is it coming back again? 7 o'clock? Is it seven o'clock? Okay, seven o'clock. So come back to seven o'clock for, a, for some guided meditation, and then after the guided meditation we'll have some uh, Q&A with a little break in between. Uh, so keep on enjoying yourself. Uh, that is the only, the most important thing of this whole retreat, that you have a good time, you enjoy yourself. Uh, that is what really matters. So keep on doing that, uh, and we'll see you at seven. Uh.